Okay, with a lot of time traveling movies, um, one of the staples, and usually with this movie, that usually when we talk about time traveling, we want somebody that's a little bit smart to go back in time. Mm -hmm. I think we, you know a lot of the movies that we talk about that you want to get, you want to have a full deck of cards. You don't want an idiot to go back in time to mm -hmm. fumble things. And this movie is another staple that maybe you want to have a protagonist that knows how to handle going back in time. Yeah, <laughs> I've always said this before. I'm probably not the person that should go back in time. Uh, yeah. Because I would do shenanigans. Okay, Nick. I've just come from the future where we filmed this episode. We need to record this episode now. You'll thank me later. Also, don't drink the coffee. Join us for Time Crimes! Welcome back to the show. I'm one of your hosts, Kyle Two from the future. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Nick from the St. Paul Filmcast. Thanks for watching. Thanks for finding us and for our loyal fans. Thank you for continuing to support the show. You can follow the show on Twitter and on Instagram. Uh, we do have a Patreon. Check that out for some great deals. Both Kyle and I are members of the Minnesota Film Critics Alliance. Check that webpage for other critics reviews as well as ours. And today we're going to talk about a film that I would put on... It's tough because it's it's 2006 or 2007. I think 07 was the official release date, which was a very, very good year. Yeah. And that's why I can't put this film in a top 10 at all on that year because that year just had like a top 50 of great movies. And I think it was available <laughs> for rental of 2008, so I would probably put on my list of top films of 2008. Mm. It's time crimes. Yeah. So Hector is being hunted by a masked man wielding a pair of scissors mm -hmm. when he stumbles upon a time machine and goes back in time you know, a few hours or so. As he tries to fix the timeline, he keeps complicating it, endangering himself and others around him. So, like I said, this is not, um, it's one of the challenges when you write, because there is no antagonist protagonist. It's a central character that's everything. Everything, <laughs> right. That you're not really familiar with. If you haven't seen the movie, don't watch the trailer. It's, I think it's far more damaging of a trailer than 13th Floor. Mm -hmm. But just go back, just watch it fresh and just kind of a new. Because I understand it was a little bit about time when I rented it, but I never got to see the trailer. And I think I enjoyed it a little bit better without seeing kind of an enticement. I think you have to go a little bit blind for this one. Yeah. Uh, and writer, director, and I guess actor, Nacho Vigalando, who, who yeah, made this movie. film, um, I became aware of him from ABCs of Death. He did a little like two minute short film on there. And he did one of the pieces, probably the best piece of VHS viral, a very, very mixed bag of anthology that horror. That was the third one. Oh, third one. Um, we watched the fourth one, of course. So the third VHS movie, he did one of the shorts in that. He did the, the really good short in an otherwise not so great installment of that series. All right. So I was aware of Nacho Vigalando. I'd heard good things about him from other people around me, and I knew about Time Crimes. And this is exactly the kind of movie I expected him to make. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Because again, like, he's basically saying, it's a it's a time travel movie with I don't want to say an idiot but like with a not smart man <laughs> right <laughs> you know? he's an idiot you right. know he's taking part in that situation and he's further complicating it because he doesn't understand time travel um, and then it's even funny because Nacho playing the character he's playing he's playing the tech working at the time machine building out in the woods is, right you know and he's basically the guy who's like He's, he's directing him on how to yes. do what he's doing in the movie, and then Hector is complicating it by not doing what he's supposed to do. Which we, we've been work with actors. Yeah. Like, I need to do this. What, just, just, you might say just, that Nacho is, like, taking out his anger on actors around him who don't listen when he yeah. says something, although I don't think he'd made enough movies at that point to be too mad about it. But, yeah. but I love it because the beginning of Hector, you understand the awkwardness. That he can't handle his wife's car. He can't sleep. He's almost like a floating vessel of an idiot yeah that's just i just want a day yep. to myself i do like the beginning of it the build up for it i think nacho does very effective of the build up like why am i invested in this guy who can't keep the trunk to yeah. door closed <laughs> very much like billy blaze kowski from night shift where the trunk is open everything flies out mm -hmm. but then that's the reason why he stays because he's like i want to take my wife you want to go grocery i don't want to drive your car anymore i'm done yeah i guess <laughs> I think that what's what's funny about his about Hector, our, our lead actor, uh, uh, Cara El Halde. I'm probably saying it wrong. I apologize. Yeah, that's why I would try. Um, so Hector, as a lead character, he is not traditional in any way, shape, or form. He's a little bit, you know, he's kind of on the older Clumsy. side, a little heavy set. He's kind of yeah, he doesn't meandering have around, star, like he doesn't build, have that kind of movie star thing, build, right? Yeah, you know, um, and and he's kind of just he's kind of just 
dad bod midlife crisis kind of stuff where he's just wanting right. to relax and just kind of take a load off. The funny thing about it is you can view this movie if you know who Nacho is as a director and writer, who I, I felt like I knew enough about him watching the movie, but I could also see the, the way audiences who didn't know him would react to this film. And the moment that he looks through the camera and he sees there's a woman taking her shirt off, there's a guy with pink bandages, and then there's this, I'm like, I already know everything that's going to happen in this movie. Just from your experiences watching. From my experience watching his other work, I'm like, I know exactly how this movie is going to play out. And I wasn't wrong at all. That doesn't mean I enjoyed it any less either. <laughs> I think I enjoy, I, I've watched this many times and it's, you still, it's almost like going back in time yep. when, you, when you watch it because, oh, that's right. You need to do this and this and this. But I like that even though he goes through the journey of, okay, I'm stuck in a loop. I'll change this. It's still part of the loop. Yeah. Well, yeah, he doesn't, he doesn't see, have the foresight to see, or I guess the hindsight in some ways. No. He doesn't have the foresight to see who he will be the next time he plays this, or the hindsight to know who he was very obviously as he's doing these things. Because he's an idiot. Yeah. And the, that's, that's maybe, that's one flaw I have in the movie, is I feel like he understands time travel more than he should for a guy that continually messes up the timeline because he does certain things when he like when he goes back the first time he has to, he does certain things to be like oh I've got to be over here at this time to do this I've got to be over here to do this right. and I'm thinking to myself he doesn't seem smart enough to know that that's going to be him here or that he's going to do this and accomplish this I don't think he's smart enough to do that but maybe the the comedy comes from the fact that he thinks he's smart enough to do this that's it, yeah. and he continually pushes himself further I just thought he was a little too smart at times yeah. For a guy that seemed very, very dumb about it. Well, we, we know about, you know, through all the quotes and everything, true stupidity is you don't know how dumb you are. Yeah. You think you're actually smart. Yeah. Smart yeah. people think they're dumb. <laughs> yeah. Um, but overall, I think the theme, and I watch this many times, is self-sabotaging. That you, you, you're constantly thinking about, am I doing right? You don't know how you are wrecking everything. Mm -hmm. And he is a wreckable force. He's even ruining his marriage. Yeah. Um, just not being helpful. Like, he's just awkward, even though everybody, she, his wife adores him. But even he's traumatizing a woman, for God's sakes. Yeah. A complete stranger. Yeah, because he feels, he feels this, like, necessity to do things the way that, that they're supposed to play out. You know, there, yeah, there is a self-sabotage aspect. I didn't like him at the beginning of the film. And it's for, like, the smallest first world problem kind of stuff you know right. doesn't want to go get groceries with his wife he complains about bringing a table over he doesn't think she's going to fit it through the door he's a complainer like it's all like the things where it's like he's not a monster he's yeah. just kind of a you just want to kind of like a jerk you yeah. know at times where it's just like come on man just stop being a, a twit um <laughs> and, <laughs> that's a perfect the, word for him the yeah. character arc he goes on is one where he continually destroys everything that he has set up, yeah. thinking he's fixing it, and had, he's like honestly toxic for everything else, including himself. Part of me wants to see Nacho Vigalondo reattack this film, remake it in some way, because I just ex I expected a little bit more of that like cyclical insanity. You can tell that this movie was made on a budget, because again, like yeah. the one the one hour back in time of it all creates one location in a lot of ways. It does. I would have liked to have seen Nacho yeah. attack this film with a larger budget because I think it would have been funnier to see like 400 versions of Hector running around because I think that's where he would have gone with it. He's the kind of guy who continually ratchets up the insanity. He's like a Rick and Morty director, you know? <laughs> it is insane. No, you don't... How many bandages do you need? You just... You just gotta like open head one. Yeah. yeah. And it's just funny, like again, I don't feel like he understands that he's what he's doing when he's like, oh, I need to bandage myself. And then he's like doing it. And the whole time he's doing it, you're like, oh yeah, okay, all right. Yeah, yeah. But then at the same time, you're thinking, when is he gonna figure out who he's becoming at this point? Like, it's it's all that looseness of like, we need more time travel idiots. Yeah, <laughs> but it's hard to write a character that's the protagonist and the antagonist at the same time. Yes. That is kind of a challenge. Mm -hmm. That Not only that, he's probably dumber than you are writing. And it's yeah. awkward to write somebody that's an idiot. Not only that, a jerk. I think be, writing but someone who's to... not smart is way tougher than writing someone who's smart. Um, and that's not to say that I think that writers well, I are... Smarter than you are. Yeah. 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 Writing someone talking... dumber than you, I think, is, is harder than smarter than you. Because okay. smarter than you, you can always make a smart person in, into a jerk. Like, you can always make them a smart jerk who thinks they're better than everyone else. Yeah, it's the Avengers are all jerks to themselves. Yeah. Whereas writing someone that's dumber than you... You, you tend to find the self-parody that comes out in that a lot of the time. Where, like, 
you're, you're writing somebody who's dumb and you're making it like funny that they're dumb and that doesn't really always work and i don't think any time that this is like funny dumb it's just a guy who shouldn't be in this situation right which makes him relatable that's why you, <laughs> you wanted somebody to go back in time make sure he's sophisticated smart enough to not wreck everything like yep. homer simpson went back in time he just starts no. Yeah. yeah. He's kind of a Homer. Yeah, oh, he's God. like Homer Simpson, just bumbling idiot. And he says the dangers uh, of it. Even Nacho's like, I can't tell you to, you know, I'm not your daddy. I can't mm. tell you to do stuff, but please, for God's sake, stop wrecking everything. Yeah. Yeah, I just, I love that, that the director put himself into the, I guess, the barometer character, if you will. Nacho is kind of that in this film, where he's kind of the guy who's telling us what we should be doing and shouldn't be doing. And, of course, we're self-sabotaging it the whole time. <laughs> I don't think there's a deeper meaning to the movie. I think it's just a series of events and use time travel as some a character, a central character that you don't use a lot of characters that could be the hero and the villain at the same time. But you question villainy as well because he's not really a pleasant person to anybody in this movie except for himself. Mm -hmm. And I think at the end, he finally realizes that why don't you just stand still and not be a force and just let things happen? Yeah. And then he f kind of figures that out. Way just stand still, shut up, and just don't be, you know, and don't be a, a villain to everything. And then you can realize how not to self sabotage. See, I saw this as an, an answer to the complaint that Indiana Jones doesn't do anything in his movie. So in Raiders of the Lost Ark, everybody always says if Indiana Jones didn't do anything, the Ark would be fine, right? I feel like that's kind of the the answer in this film is that honestly, if Hector just didn't do anything. Yeah. The film would like there would be no movie, but he wouldn't be in any trouble either. If he just saw the, no he saw the naked woman out in the field and he saw the guy with bandages and he was just like, nope, going to bed. And he just got up and went to bed. Movie done. Life much better. Right. But we <laughs> but do that with searches, every character. Yeah. We do that with every. I mean, every yeah. movie we critique, we do that with every character. We just maybe you self analyze previous episode. Maybe you just do some self inventory. Yep. And not just be a force of reckoning. Yeah, because yeah. everything he does makes the movie, it makes his journey more difficult. He does yeah. not succeed at all. And even even at the end of the film, he succeeds only to the level that he accomplishes one thing. But it's at the detriment of a lot of other things. Like, yeah. he, he doesn't yes. walk away clean in this movie at all. Uh, one thing I want to, I feel like this film might be an exercise for Vigalondo. Because he has really, I think, four characters in the whole film. Two guys, two girls. And it's almost an exercise of let's see let's see how much I can use a simple concept of a time travel machine that sends you back like an hour. Yeah. And just see how much I can mess with that timeline a little bit. And I think that's kind of what he's doing. He's just kind of testing himself as a writer here. And see if I can put some kind of a horrific horror movie Because yeah, there's a weird vibe to it, you know, yeah. like... If, if this wasn't a, a time travel movie, The Bandage Man would definitely have been a horror icon. Yeah, very um, much Dark Man. But yeah. Was, yeah. <laughs> Pink Dark Man. Pink Dark Man. Um, but part of me also... If you didn't you know Dark to, Man, go back and look at Dark Man. You have to really respect the filmmaking process of this movie. That's why I put it in my notes. The continuity. It's incredible. And in uh, looking through the credits, you can see there was an actor cast to play the other Hector from the back a lot okay. he cast a guy who just had a similar back of his head oh, for the similar body part? structure well just so that like the moment where like he hits him with stabs him with the scissors and we're watching Hector do it and the guy falls down but we don't see his face and then scrambles off right. it's a different actor playing Hector there so we can have both of them on screen because you can't really do the CG thing if you're making a Cheap. independent yeah. low budget movie right um, that's the bandage thing too. but you as you watch the film there's so many times where the camera like the shot had to have been part of the writing process how the camera was going to move because how are we in going the to script? Yeah, so the plan had to have been like all the way at the scripting stage. How will I accomplish this shot? How will I accomplish this shot? There's specific story directions that are made to accomplish shots on a budget yeah. that I have to really re like give credit to because that's not easy to do. Is when I'm writing, I don't want to think about how the thing's being made. No, and I, I went, after rewatching this for the third time because I was like, they have to, to have two camera to do this film or to do a specific shot, they had to use two cameras. But then you also work about the dangers of two cameras, about the lighting and everything. Mm -hmm. But there's certain things that are like, no, they had to use three, three cameras. So I think the budget for part of pre-production had to be a heck of a journey. I would like to invest in a little more detail and a little mm -hmm. more knowledge about pre-production because I think, yeah, in the script, they had to talk about marks and camera placements and con continuity of what has to happen and what you have to wear. And like he comes out of the time machine gooey wet, so he's there's certain scenes where you go back and he's still wet. Yeah. 
Hector won. Right. And, and so it is a, a grueling challenge to make this yeah. movie. Yeah. There's specifically, I think it's the, it might be the last shot or one of the last shots of the film where the camera goes over the house mm -hmm. and examines just basically the Very much Dario Argento kind of a thing. Yeah. But when you see it, like the, first, the, the previous shot is looking at Hector and his wife as they're sitting just staring off into the distance like, don't look, don't look, don't look while this is happening. And then the next shot is for them from the back. And again, if you, if you know where the shot's going to go, you think to yourself, okay, that's not the same actor anymore. Because now we're seeing from the back of his head as the camera pans over the house. We yeah. see the dead body and we see Hector, the actor playing Hector, running to the car. And it's like, again, that simple cut and change of perspective allows him to accomplish so much more on a minuscule budget than what you'd have to do if you paid for, like, CG, yeah. you know, to keep the shot going. That's another effective use if he couldn't use two camera. Yep, is have, have a good, like, secondary actor that can play the back end of Hector as he's running around. It's really clever. Watch the movie twice. Because I, I did this, I had it on the background for I finished it once, and I just looked for every moment where there was other Hector actor and regular Hector actor, and when they had to do the change. It's so clever that you have to give credit for him. He is a dynamic director that's really trying different things. And so we're also Chekhov's binoculars here. And yeah. I think um, Nacho, <laughs> uh, Nacho is good. using, not as just a prop, but also as a character's identity. Mm -hmm. This is why I like the writing of it, is because not only is it because you're going back in time and this the voyeurism, but here is the character, Hector, what you want him to do is to look a little more introspective of life, look closer, but instead he's just, He's not seeing yep. what you should be seeing, right? He's getting a close, better view of the distance, but he's not using the binoculars on himself. Yeah. He's just, oh, that looks cool. What you want to use is look a little bit better what's going around. Why don't you mind your surroundings a little bit better? Yeah. And he's not using effect. I like the proper, the binoculars, as an effective way, as a character. So what you're saying is this is time travel rear window. Um, <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> It's binoculars as things you shouldn't see, but you're trying to, you, you can see things better, but you're not getting better insight on yourself. Yeah, it's, right. turning, it's turning your Might be a little too deeper for than what the movie is supposed to be, but that's how I perceive what the binoculars are part of the movie. Yeah, and again, like that might go back to, this is a stronger, this is a stronger ideas and concept script. It's yeah. very rudimentary, like the, the time travel is so simplistic here that that's one of the faults I think I have on the film is that it's very, again, it's very obvious how this thing is going to start playing out. I like moments where like- Well, you catch it very early, what's gonna happen. Yeah, I like I like moments where Vigilando kind of plays with expectations. Like again, when Hector two, I believe it's two, is going up the stairs the and bandage, the table comes- The bandage guy is yeah. Hector two, yeah. Um, when the table comes flying down at him and we hear a woman scream. But then when we see Hector three going through it, the woman is not the person throwing the table. The, the person throwing the table is Hector Three. Yeah. And so again, just playing almost, with the expectation of what we think is going to happen. It's almost really like fun. a comedy bit of waiting for the timing of. Yeah, it's almost like the like taking the Wilhelm scream and turning it into a tension. You know, <laughs> where it's just like, when's it going to happen? When's the scream? And then, oh, it's not even the person's scream. Like those kinds of things are funny. It's just a very. It's the ideas are much stronger, I think, than the story itself. The story I agree. is pretty simple. That doesn't mean it's a bad movie. It just means that, again, the story's being told very well. It's just a simple story. The story is very rudimentary. of just, you can see the brainstorm. Yep. What if I take an idiot that's self-sabotaging, self-abusing, jerk, maybe you can feel sorry for what's going through him. Yeah. <laughs> and just realize, maybe if you just shut up and have a little more insight, that you won't be a reckoning force to everybody around you. Yeah. There, and that's the movie. And it's it's a well shot movie. Like technically speaking, I like the I music. Think I a like lot, the that's editing. A heavy challenge because you have continuity problems. You have maybe you have to use two cameras, three yep. cameras. And uh, cinematographer uh, Flavio Martinez Labiano. I hope I said that right. I apologize. Uh, has actually done a lot since Time Crimes. He's worked with Disney now on films like Jungle Cruise. He did The Shallows, which I don't think is a good movie, but I think it's a well shot movie. No. Um, uh, you know, Laviano has done a lot of, he's like slowly built up that career with well shot movies. And I think again, the from the planning stage of the script, adapting yeah. that script to a shot list, being able to work with a, a really tight budget and being able to make something that's dynamic and interesting at a house with four people 
is really tough to do, and that show that's a showcase for him as a as a cinematographer for where he can take things. Yeah, because he had a lot of point of view of the binoculars, tough to shoot yep. that because you have your camera, but you have to put the, the you know filters yep. and everything. But also how you shoot the car accident, the car car bump. Yeah, because yeah. I was actually very. That was you one part the camera I was on, you're like, about. Oh my god, the camera! Because they could hit the camera, but it doesn't. Yeah, yeah. I, that was yeah. one of the only plot points I think that I was like confused about, thinking like, oh wait, so who hit? Who? Like, and I was like waiting for that part to be like solved. Right. Even though, again, I could have just paused the movie and thought to myself, oh, obviously, okay. Yeah. You know, it was it was well shot to that point where it does actually kind of confuse you a bit, and make you want to find out more. It still does, but, even after you're watching it. Or did I go back in time and watch it for the first time? No, that was Rear Window. Um. <laughs> <laughs> so, have you seen Time Crimes? Yeah. Uh, are you going to be like me? Please put in the comments uh, what I put it in my top ten of 2008 because I saw it's rental available in 2008, and I think it's supposed to be a 2007 kind mm -hmm. of a release, kind of a film. Which is heavy. A lot of 2007 good films. Yeah, yeah. That whole like time period just exploded with with directors getting their yeah. things done. Uh, yeah. Let us know your thoughts on Time Crimes down below. Should we cover another Nacho Vigalondo film? Uh, I know he did like Colossal with Anne Hathaway. So let us know down in the comments if we should return to to Nacho's world for another movie. Um, and while you're down there, please like and subscribe. Yes. Let us know your thoughts on the film and join us for the conversation as well. It's one of our favorite things to do is interact with our, our subscribers. Uh, and again, thank you guys so much for helping us cross the 300 subscriber threshold. Yeah, you know, we're really, really proud of the, the group and family that we've built over here. Um, once you do all that, go ahead and check out that Patreon as well. We have a small Patreon subscriber base, but those guys always get their voices heard. If you join the Patreon, you get to help us pick the movies yes, we talk about. You get access to Picks with Kyle and Nick, our monthly show that appears for patrons only. You get exclusive Patreon content. There's just, there's all sorts of goodies in there. Tiers start as low as a dollar and go all the way up. Support us at whatever level you think you're capable to do, and we'd love to have, have you over there. And once again, folks, you can find all my film reviews over at GoFilmReviews.com. You can find my show, The St. Paul Filmcast, anywhere you find podcasts. Um, and our time-traveling meeting next time will be next Thursday, right? Yep. i got to go warn myself about that real quick. <laughs>